going to tell you the truth about a Toyota oil burning engine. In this case, it's in a 2008 RAV4. And what it is, a 2.4 liter 2AZ FE engine. Now what happens is, as these engines age, they often start to burn some oil. It was a design flaw. They basically did not design the pistons and the piston rings correctly and then oil gets burnt because instead of sealing the oil from the combustion chamber, the oil goes by the piston rings and is burnt inside the engine. Now it's relatively easy to tell if your engine's burning oil. If it's not dripping on the ground and you're losing oil, just take out a spark plug and if you find the end of the spark plug has a bunch of built up carbon, it's all hard and it's starting to clog up the spark plug, you got an engine that's burning oil. Now when I was a young mechanic, Chevrolet made these Vegas that had serious oil burning problems. Their mistake was they built a car that had a cast aluminum block, but a cast iron head. It was kind of a stupid design to begin with. Why would you make one light and the other heavy? You should have made the whole thing aluminum. But regardless, this cast aluminum block had pistons that went up and down with piston rings, steel piston rings. And for some crazy reason, the engineers convinced GM they could spray on the inside of the aluminum block to keep them from burning oil. Well, fixed, didn't last so long. Sometimes those things have 20, 30,000 miles on it, they'd wear out, and they'd burn oil like mad. A friend of mine had one. We had to put a quart of oil in that thing about every 50 miles of driving. It was absurd. Now, GM only had two real solutions. One, you'd have to take the engine apart. You'd have to put stainless steel sleeves inside the block and then put it all back together. They should have built it that way in the first place. Or just put a cast iron engine back in them with some guys did. But going back to this Toyota, now we got the valve cover off. You can see the timing chain, you can see the cam here. See it's nice and shiny, the oil's been changed a lot in this vehicle. There's no sludge or anything. But if you wanted to fix the oil burning, you would have to take the entire head off the engine, replace the piston rings, usually the pistons, and that costs you three to five thousand dollars. Now, the strange thing about this problem is, sometimes Toyota fixes them for free, sometimes they don't. I've had customers had new piston rings, new pistons put in by Toyota for absolutely nothing. They stop burning oil. But, I've also had customers, they wouldn't do anything for them. They'd say, oh, it's too high mileage, it's too old, but really, they know it was a design flaw. It's not like these people didn't change their oil regularly. As with the Chevy Vegas, it was a design flaw. Now, they don't burn oil as bad as the Vegas did, but for a perfection company like Toyota, kind of annoying to have a Toyota that burns oil, especially if you maintain the vehicle well. You change your oil all the time and it still burns oil, it's a design flaw that they should stand behind, regardless of the age or mileage of the car. They know they messed up with this particular engine. Now they didn't make the block wrong like Chevy did in the Vega. This does have an aluminum block, but this has cast iron cylinder liners. So the pistons don't ride up and down on aluminum like they did in the Vega. They ride up and down on the cast iron liners. The problem is they didn't make the piston rings and the pistons correctly. And those are the parts that wear. The main problems are these four cylinder engines from 2007 to 2009. Those are the main ones that really burn oil. They obviously had some kind of production problems from 2007 to 2009. Now they don't make these engines anymore, but they had a long run. They started in 2000 and they ended in 2018. But for the 2007 to 2009, they had a lot of problems. Now Toyota claims that over 1.7 million of them were made that can have this problem. And they say that they will perform a test on them if they're under so many years and so many miles to determine if they need to be rebuilt or not. But Toyota never gave any figures on how many they actually rebuilt of these 1.7 million. They're not telling us, so we have no idea. And unfortunately, I see this all the time from most car manufacturers. They'll put out some kind of Oh, we screwed up, bring it in and we'll check it out. And from my experience, nine times out of 10 with my own customers, they'll say, oh, that's not covered under their warranty. That's a different model, or that has too many miles, or yada, yada, yada. They're always making excuses. Now, other than the oil burning, it's actually a great engine. And since it's cast aluminum, this one, with cast iron liners, so it's got liners, the piston rings wear on the pistons, but it's not like they blow up like the Chevy Vegas did. 
They didn't have anything lying on them. They were just bare aluminum. These things will continue to run, but they do burn oil, which is a bad thing in a modern car because if you burn oil, it's going to clog up the catalytic converter. Then you have to buy another catalytic converter. It'll ruin the oxygen sensors, even though it's a little bit at a time, still eventually damages the vehicle. And of course, if you're not big on maintaining your car all that well, I had a customer of mine last year and she was never checking the oil in her Camry, which had the same exact engine as that. When I checked it, it only had one half of a quart of oil. Out of four and a half quarts in it, only had half a quart left when I changed the oil. She's lucky it didn't blow the engine up. And I have seen engines blown up in these things because they ran out of oil because the people didn't realize they were burning oil. Of course, Toyota has such a good reputation. A lot of people just drive them. They don't check anything. They don't check the air in the tires, they don't check the oil in the engine, they don't check the coolant because they're used to a car that just runs and runs and runs. They don't have to do anything to it. So let's say you got one of these engines and it is burning off. Why don't you just make a copy of this video or leave it on your phone. Go to Toyota. Tell them, hey, that's not fair. You need to put new piston rings and pistons in this engine. You guys messed up. You should stand behind what you've built. I've personally got involved in some of my own customers' cars, and guess what? Magically, they got their engines rebuilt by local Toyota dealerships. I mean, I make no bones about it. Toyota makes really good vehicles. But they messed up on this particular design, especially the 2007 to 2009. So, if you own one of these Toyotas, you just need to go to the sticker. And look here, if it says 2AZFE, that means it's one of these engines that can burn oil, especially if it's a 2007 to 2009. This is the GMC 1500 all-wheel drive. As we open the hood, we can see it's got a big old 5.3 liter V8 engine. Actually, they're great engines, but they got one big problem. They have that stupid cylinder deactivation system, and it's been proven that it leads to excessive wear in the engine. The cylinders that get deactivated aren't lubricated correctly, and it leads to internal expensive wear that a normal V8 engine would never have. Now, my customer here just bought this used. He likes the truck, but he wants a truck with a big V8 engine. He says, I don't want a truck that runs on four cylinders, sometimes six and sometimes eight. I like the power. And I gotta say, it's a beautiful truck, got a big old bed, and it can certainly tow a lot. But anyone in their right mind realizes, if you're gonna tow heavy weight, carry a lot of weight in the bed, you're not gonna get very good gas mileage with any vehicle especially the gasoline, you should go diesel if you're gonna do that. Having one that goes eight cylinder, six, four, it's stupid for a vehicle you're gonna pull stuff with. I mean, the only dumber thing I can think of is that new four cylinder engine that they're putting in the 1500s. And yeah, theoretically it puts up 300 something horsepower, but when you load them down, they get horrible gas mileage and they just aren't that great at pulling. They don't have the torque. You know why they made V8 engines? That V8 engine configuration has a lot of torque for pulling stuff. And of course, it's a big, heavy truck. It's gonna get crappy gas mileage. All trucks do in the real world. Don't believe these rating systems that they give you the federal estimated mileage. The government doesn't even test hardly. I think they test like 18% of them. The rest, they just go by the data the companies give them. So it's not believable in many cases. To me, the cylinder deactivation is just the stopgap measure to get better gas mileage. You're never gonna get great gas mileage on one of these things. Even with the system, the thing gets like 19 miles a gallon on a highway. Doesn't make all that much difference if you're just cruising in a straight V8. Now this particular one just purchased, there's a little bit left on the warranty. So the customer is going to leave that aspect alone for the time being. But he figures when it's out of warranty, he's going to take it to a professional tuner who's going to deactivate the cylinder deactivation. He's going to deactivate the deactivation. And I think that's a smart move. But take my advice. Only have a real pro do it. They do it. They do it right. So the system doesn't come on anymore. You'll be happier. There's kits you can buy, but you never know. You know, some of these Chinese made kits are a little iffy, but that at least can be bypassed easily by a pro. People have been doing it for years. The other problem these 1500 and L4 is more insidious. And that has to do with what's going on under the truck. The automatic transmission right there. This particular one is a six speed automatic transmission. There's also an eight speed. The eight speed actually has more problems than the six speeds generally. But this one shifting kind of weird, even though it only has 35,000 miles on it. That's under warranty. So he took it to a GMC dealer and they theoretically road tested for half an hour and said, oh, we can't find anything wrong and gave it back to him. So 
We're gonna do a real analysis of this and see what the truth is. We'll plug in my scan tool. We've got a diagnostics, GM, GMC, same company. Monte Carlo, we'll do automatic selection, read. One thing about these new ones, at least, they think pretty fast. See, we don't have much of a time lag here. We got the automatic six speed. Here we go with diagnosis. We'll do an auto scan. All right, now it's got coach for the radio, but who even cares about that in HVAC so it doesn't show any codes for the transmission now that particularly doesn't shock me because GM kind of cheats on these things and they make the parameters for the transmission shifting to be acceptable at such a wide range that they don't trip any codes because even though you feel it's shifting weird well the computer says well that's not 35 percent too bad so we'll accept that it won't trip a code so we're going to look at live data instead and here we go we'll check the shift first oh be quiet you stupid thing <laughs> i hate seat belt systems that warn you well in this part everything's pretty much okay i don't see any faults there's nothing odd so we'll go back to the next step we'll check the solenoid valves and as we scroll through there's no particular problems other than the charging voltage is a little bit high it's 14.7 14.8 so later we're going to check that now we're looking at further data and we can see here the torque converter slip speed now it's in park and it's a little bit off it shouldn't be doing anything since it's in park it should be more or less zero and you can see it's going 15 17 Sometimes it even goes into negative figures. Let's see what happens if you rev it up. See, as we rev it up, it gets more normal. Three, seven, four. Now it went negative for a second. This is in park. Let's see what happens if you put it in drive. Now it's staying around 500, which is pretty normal. We're going to watch the shift time as we drive. The good road test will analyze all this data. I'm watching the data as it's shifting. Sometimes it's 0.45 a second. The three to four was now 0.18. It shifted a little better that time. We'll start all over again. All right, now let's watch the shifts. Shift a little faster now. 35. They're all 35. 18, it was faster because he slowed down and sped up. The shift times aren't bad. You can see the five to six shift is really fast. 0 0.08 seconds. Which doesn't surprise me because you're already rolling and it's generally the last gears that wear the least. All right, now we're going to go 0 to 65. Here we go and we'll see what the shift times are like. 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. See, the higher we're going, the better it's shifting. 4 to 5 is 0.28. 5 to 6 is point one eight. You can see the longest was 1 to 2. Now, the computer adapts these things as you're driving. All these adaptations can be radically changed by changing the computer software. And expert transmission guys and tuners, they can do that and set it up to the way you like. The only thing you got to worry about is if there's any internal wear. Now, this thing's only got 35,000 miles, so I'm assuming there's not too much internal wear. And if the dealer isn't going to do anything about the way it's got a little clunk and stuff, my next advice is have a pro tune the transmission because that could get rid of any of the clunking problems because of the software that's in it now. You can go more aggressive, less aggressive, and the tuner can set it up the way you want. Now here the problem is, we got the dual problems. This is why you can only have a pro mess with these things because it's always shifting gears to try to get the best gas mileage, but it's also messing with the engine, sometimes turning some cylinders on and off. We're gonna find a hill and test it going uphill. Okay, now we're going uphill. I felt it jiggle, it definitely jiggled. There's also a tiny clunk when you let off the gas. Well, unfortunately, the shafts on these GM products are often sloppy and have weak yokes in them. And so they get a little bit of play in them. And when you take your foot off the gas, that's reverse torque. And you can hear it and feel it in this every once in a while, especially if you're going uphill and let go. Now, some guys that are fanatic enough, they'll take them apart and they'll re-grease them. And then they find 10, 15,000 miles later, the clunk comes back and then they re-grease them again. It isn't really going to hurt anything, but it is annoying if you just bought a car with 35,000 miles and it does. Now all this was in two-wheel drive. Now we put it in four-wheel drive, see if there's any difference. I can hear the four-wheel drive humming. You can see it's still kind of shifting, not all that different. First to second takes the longest and they kind of gradually get less. Here we go, we're going down. We'll go up the hill and we'll take our foot off the gas and we'll see if we had that same clunk. Didn't really feel anything. Aha, 35,000 miles. It shouldn't have been doing it and that kind of shows me that I see this in a lot when they're older is that four-wheel drive you can turn it on and off this four-wheel drive system that it has when we're only using the rear the front is just floating that's why I heard the clunk since there's really not much torque on it and it's just floating along that kind of tells me 
it's being strained. The front wheel drive part of the four wheel drive is making a little bit of noise, which I often see in these things, even brand new. Now, as you can see, it's not horrible, but it's annoying to somebody who has a vehicle with 35,000 miles on it, it's still under warranty, that they're not gonna do anything about it. I know if he goes back, they're still not gonna do anything about it. Torque converter's a little weak, but it's not outrageous. Probably the yokes have too much play in them, and they make the clunking noise when you let go, because when you let go, you have reverse torque. And then when there's reverse torque, if there's too much slack in the yokes, you get a little clunk. No big deal, but it's annoying that you pay this kind of money for a vehicle, and with that small amount of mileage, it's got clunks and thumps. From my experience with these things, the 1500s, you're generally gonna get maybe 140 to 150,000 miles out of the transmission. They wanna keep the vehicle, get a factory rebuilt transmission, it could go another 140, 150,000 miles. It's always gonna have little noises, jiggles and stuff because of this modern six speed. And if you think this is bad, get in an eight speed version of these things. Cause most of these have eight speeds and nobody knows exactly how long those things are gonna last. From my experience, they don't even last 150,000 miles before they actually break down. From my experience with these, I don't think it's ever gonna just break and stop working. Make more clunky noises. And some guys that are absolute fanatics, like I said, they'll take the shafts off of the entire four-wheel drive system. They'll grease them with heavy grease, put them back on, and the noise goes away for a while until the grease wears off. And then they do that clunking when you take your foot off the gas. So really, when you buy a vehicle like this, nice, beautiful looking vehicle, you don't expect to have problems like that. Getting rid of the cylinder deactivation, no big deal, just pay a pro to do it. You can turn it off on the vehicle so that it doesn't go into sixth gear but then every time that you're driving it you got to keep resetting it and then it won't go into sixth gear that's when you're towing it'll only go up to fifth gear i mean what's the point of having an automatic transmission with six speeds you can't use all six if you want to do the cylinder deactivation shut off just as I say, it's a half-assed way to get better gas mileage. I think it's stupid. They should have never made it in the first place. I mean, come on now, GM. People want a big truck, they buy a big truck. Don't tune the engine down. And there goes a screaming Ford diesel as I talk. You want to mess around with V6 engines, four-cylinder engines, go ahead. But if somebody wants a truck, the V8 engine, give them a truck with a V8 engine. Not some ridiculous system. And don't keep adding gear after gear onto the transmission and then they don't really shift right because they might have not been designed right, the software's not right, and then they say, oh, we can fix it with the software, and sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. There's so much levels of complexity on it that it even confuses them, and they don't know exactly what to do because they got to get good gas mileage for the ratings epa stuff but the customers still want power and smoothness trying to balance all that with these crazy high-tech systems it's often an impossible task we got a brand new 2021 chevy trailblazer to begin with it's kind of a strange vehicle because if you checked out the original trailblazer they're pretty big they were like small suburbans if anything these have actually shrunk over time it's a crossover suv and a compact crossover completely different but a lot of people are looking for small crossovers what do you get with this now when this first came out it was one of their fastest selling vehicles they are nice looking and believe it or not being an suv this thing can get 36 miles a gallon on a highway if you're driving 55 miles an hour it's got a little bitty turbo engine and you can see it's got gasoline direct injection and by little bitty i mean little bitty check out the sign 1.3 liters and this is the big engine this is the optional engine this regular engine is 1.2 liters but actually the 1.3 gets better gas mods than 1.2 it's strained less it's got the turbo to ram more air in and unless you drive like a maniac and are always over revving it, you'll actually get better gas mods with this 1.3 liter engine. But you're taking a bit of a gamble. Think about it. It was made in Mexico, the engine. No, it's a beautiful looking vehicle. You can see why people buy them. But understand it's a GM. It's made in Korea. Tires kind of give it away because it's got Hankook tires on it. Now, it's a brand new vehicle. He hadn't had any real problems yet. But, and this would kind of make me wonder, it's brand new. But there's already condensation going inside the light. Water's leaking in there. Who knows? Maybe GM sent some of their workers to Korea that don't do such a hot job. And now the Koreans are making cars that leak like GM has for decades. Let's check out the inside before we take it for a ride. Brand new, so of course it's going to start. And you can see it's got everything you need. Attack. Hood's open because we had the hook open. It's got all the fancy little electronics on it. Now this is a more basic car, so it's got no sunroof. But even though it's a 360, 
cylinder engine will put it in the gear and does it shake no it doesn't shake at all no yeah it's only got 9400 miles on it it has all that crazy stuff like electronic parking brakes that i'm not a big fan of but as we check the back seat there's room in here it's not humongous but there's room for people back here it will open the trunk you can say seats snap down if you want to make the seat snap down give you a lot more room for carrying stuff and it may only be a three-cylinder engine but it's got dual exhaust on it very nice wheels with this brakes and this is a fancy version so it's got all-wheel drive talk about the back look at the front seat it actually moves the whole way down you flip that down you can put a bed in there and sleep there you can really carry a lot of stuff put something on here you could really get long things in here now it's all-wheel drive it is basically a four-wheel drive all-wheel drive because if you're just driving it normally only the front wheels drive it and it's just front wheel drive it only turns into all-wheel drive when you push the all-wheel drive button if you ask me technically it's four-wheel drive because it's two-wheel drive unless you push the button but when you push the button then it's all-wheel drive they're getting a lot of hybrid systems and this is one of them it's a smaller suv so it handles really well it's up high enough you can see here we're high enough up in here not outrageously high. it really handles a lot better than a larger SUV will. There's no arguing that. It's relatively quiet for an all-wheel drive vehicle. Although we only have it in front-wheel drive now. Who we'll put an all-wheel drive? See what it sounds like now. Still sounds pretty much the same. This isn't like one of those groaning four-wheel drive jobs where you hear the diffs humming and the transfer cases making lots of noise. It is made in Korea. It is an Asian design. And a lot of their designs are a lot quieter than the American designs. We'll come to a stop and see what does this 1.3 liter turbo do? Here we go. Really, for a 1.3 liter engine, that's not bad in an SUV. Doesn't make all that much noise for a tiny little engine. And speaking of transmissions, as we take off here, it went down good, it went up good. You can hardly even feel the chip. It's relatively lightweight, it's not heavy, but with all wheel drive, you're not gonna get stuck in the snow with one of these. But as I said, the engine is made in Mexico. Only time will tell. Make sure you watch my videos for the next 10 years just to see what happens with this thing. So if you never wanna miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.